Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the main interface for Security Onion, the Security Onion Console, or SOC. This is a web interface that contains the tools that your analysts use to investigate the collected logs for malicious activity, as well as the configuration interfaces for the various components in Security Onion. Those of you who used earlier, pre-2.4 versions of the platform may recall that there was an awful lot of configuration work that could only be done from the command line. With the exception of running the Security Onion updater, which we'll discuss in the next video, all of that has been moved into the web interface. No more maintaining a separate set of SSH credentials in case an analyst needs to tune a rule. We begin by logging into the SOC with the username and password that we established during installation. Since this was the first account created, it is automatically set up as a super user, meaning it has access to all of the components in Security Onion. There is support for role-based access control in the platform, Check our documentation for details. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen is the version of our installation, in this case 2.4.70. This is helpful information to have if you're posting or searching on the discussion forums, as different versions of the platform may have different underlying libraries or components. Along the left-hand side of the browser window are links to the different tools that are part of the platform. The ones above the horizontal line were specifically written as part of Security Onion. The ones below it are third-party products or projects that have been integrated into it. Right now, we're on the Overview screen, which is the default landing page for anyone who logs into SOC. As you can see under Customize This Space at the bottom, this page can be updated with any text or links you like. Some people use this to link to an internal document repository, an on-call list, incident response playbooks, or other documentation that might be helpful to an analyst. The interface for customizing this page is Markdown compliant, so you can easily add formatted text or images. See our documentation for more details. In the upper right corner, you'll see this silhouette icon. That leads to some account settings, as well as some documentation for the platform. The first option toggles dark mode on and off for the SOC interface. What's New opens up the release notes for this version of Security Onion. Help opens up the full documentation, and Cheat Sheet opens up a guide for some helpful commands and file locations in the Security Onion installation. Please note that all of these documentation options are locally installed on the Security Onion server, so even if you're in an air gap deployment with no internet access, you'll still have this copy of the docs. Blog opens up a link to the Security Onion blog, where we post information about product and platform updates. Finally, Settings allows you to modify the properties of your account here in SOC. As you can see, here under Profile, you can set the name attached to this account. And here under the Security tab, you can reset the account password, as well as setting up multi-factor authentication using either a TOTP client or a security key. See our documentation for more details. Now that we've seen the account settings, let's take a look at some of the tools built into the SOC interface. We're going to start a little out of order with the grid screen. The grid screen shows a list of all the nodes in the Security Onion deployment, or grid. In this case, since this is a single evaluation install, there's just one node listed. We've got the node ID, which is the host name, the role we've assigned to it, the IP address, the version of Security Onion that's running on it, the model, which is only filled in for hardware appliances from Security Onion Solutions, the number of events the node is receiving per second, when it last communicated with the manager, and how long ago the node was first joined to the grid. At the end of the line, we have this status bubble, which usually says OK in a healthy deployment, but can show states like reboot, pending, or fault if there are issues that need to be addressed. Opening up the node information by clicking on this caret will show more details. Node status on the left shows us information about the node, including some simple operational data like memory and CPU usage and storage utilization. This is all live telemetry data that's collected and stored in InfluxDB, which we'll talk about in a moment. In the middle column are status indicators for the various containers that make up the security onion installation on this node. Since this is an eval node, you'll see there are containers for things like the web interface, SO SOC, the database, SO Elasticsearch, and the sensor components, SO Suricata. On more specialized nodes, you may see different containers listed. This is helpful because if you have a fault in one component that's keeping the container from spinning up properly, say for example, there's a typo in a Logstash pipeline, you'll see that container fault status on this list and know where to start troubleshooting. Finally, on the right, there's a spot for a hardware appliance image. 
Again, this is only relevant if you're running Security Onion on one of our appliances. It gives a helpful view of the front and back of the server to check the port layout for operational purposes. At the bottom of the node status pane, you'll see there are a few icons in white. From right to left, there's a help icon that can open up the documentation for the grid interface. There's a power button icon that can be used to reboot the node. There's an upload icon that can be used to manually import a PCAP or EVTX file into the node. There's a test data icon, and there's a node status icon. Let's click on test data. As you can see, the test data icon will automatically download and replay some test traffic into the monitoring interface. A word of warning, we have seen issues in some environments where this test traffic shows up in other monitoring tools or sensors. So please make sure that your security team is aware if you do this. We're going to ingest this test data now so that we've got something to look at when we get to the alerting and hunting tools later in this demo. Finally, if we click on this node status icon, it will open up the influx DB tool in another tab. This is going to be a lot of the same performance information that was available in the grid screen, with the difference that it also provides the historical telemetry and not just the current status. If you're trying to analyze trends in things like data ingestion or CPU usage, this is a good place to start. There are also some simple alarms built in by default for things like high disk utilization or a drop off in monitoring traffic. You can either check them manually like this or set up alarms to systems like Slack or PagerDuty. Setting up those alarms is a bit beyond the scope of this video, but there are more details in our documentation or in the docs for the InfluxDB project. So that's InfluxDB. Let's go back to SOC. We'll start with the Alerts tab. Alerts is intended to be a central clearinghouse for all of the potentially malicious events that have been detected in your environment. Whether the detection rule is written for Suricata, in Sigma, or in Yara, when it matches something in your environment and fires, this is where the alert will appear. By default, the alerts will be grouped together by rule name. For example, you can see here that we've got 16 of these GPL SNMP public access UDP alerts. If we want to drill down and examine them individually, we can do that by clicking on the number next to the rule name. Now you'll see the list of individual alert items with data about their network flows, source IP and port, destination IP and port, and so on. Each alert has these two icons next to it, one that looks like a bell and one that looks like a warning sign. The bell icon will acknowledge the alert and remove it from the alert screen. It's not deleted, simply flagged as acknowledged so that nobody else sees it in the list and wastes their time investigating it. The triangle, on the other hand, will escalate the alert into cases for further investigation. Now if we open up the cases interface, you'll see here I've got a new case with the name of the alert I escalated. This is a place to keep notes and findings as I track down what caused that alert. We'll dig much more deeply into alerts and cases when we get to workflow one, but I wanted to introduce them to you briefly here so you know what they look like. Leaving this case behind, we can also tune this detection rule from here in the alerts interface. If I click on the rule name and then tune detection, you'll see it takes me to a tuning page for the detection rule itself. We see here that it's a Suricata rule from the ET Open rule set, licensed under the BSD license, and it was last updated in 2019. If I want to disable the rule entirely, I can do it with this sliding switch in the upper right corner. If I want to tune the rule more granularly, say I want to put in a suppression rule so that the alert doesn't fire for a particular source IP, I can do that here. Much like with alerts and cases, we'll get much more into detections and tuning when we get to the workflows, especially workflow three. But I wanted to give you a taste of how easy it is to pivot straight from a false positive to the interface where you can tune it out. Moving on, let's take a look at Hunt. Hunt is designed as a fast, flexible threat hunting interface for analysts to use during an investigation. There's a query box up at the top of the page here there are also a bunch of pre-built queries loaded, and you can always add your own that makes sense in your environment. For example, this log type query will return all of the different types of logs that the Security Onion instance has ingested. As you can see, the logs are all sorted into different modules and data sets, depending on what sort of data it is and where it came from. If I want to specifically hunt into the network metadata that I've recorded, I can click on Zeek under Event Module, and then Include to add that to the query. Now you'll see that this group metrics pane includes only Zeek records. 
If I want to narrow it down further, say only look at Zeek HTTP traffic, I can click on Zeek HTTP under event dataset and include that as well. Now you see we've only got Zeek HTTP data here. If we scroll down a bit, you'll see that the individual zeek.http events are all listed here. I can click on the caret on the left-hand side of the window to open up individual events and see all the data about them. I can also continue narrowing my search. For example, if I only want to see HTTP traffic on non-standard ports, that's easy to do by clicking on destination port 80 and then exclude to add a not clause to my query. And there you have it. In just a couple clicks, I've narrowed down my focus to show only HTTP traffic moving on non-standard ports in my environment over the last 24 hours. Now for a more visual approach to that process, we can use the Dashboards tool. Dashboards comes with a whole host of pre-built visualizations arranged and classified by the data that they represent. For example, if I want to look at HTTP data, as I did in Hunt, there's a pre-built HTTP dashboard for that. Here you see we get a Sankey diagram and a bunch of tables with information about HTTP traffic in my environment. If I want to do the same thing and exclude traffic on port 80, I can do that by clicking on this destination port table. All of these tables are fully interactive, just like the event tables in Hunt were. You'll notice that all of these tables and the Sankey diagram were immediately updated to show only traffic on non-standard ports. That query change applies to all of them simultaneously. We'll talk a lot more about hunt and dashboards when we get to workflow two and threat hunting, but suffice it to say for now, they are very, very powerful tools designed to be as fast and flexible as possible when you're hunting for anomalous or malicious events in a giant pool of log data. Now, one of the strengths of Security Onion is that it does full packet capture, and that full packet capture is integrated with the rest of the platform seamlessly. Let's take a look at this first HTTP record as an example. You see here we've got a web interface for evaluating this PCAP. We can see the source and destination ports and IPs as the conversation progresses, along with the TCP flags that are being set in each packet. If we want to see the raw data, that's possible by clicking on this list icon at the top. We can also click the hex button to remove the hex dump from the side. And now you see we've got a plain transcript view of the TCP session. If we need to do further analysis, we can download the PCAP using the download button in the upper right, or send it straight into CyberChef for future manipulation with the toast icon. If you haven't seen CyberChef before, it's an awesome tool, and we'll talk about it in a few moments. In addition to that event-driven pivot into a PCAP, which retrieves only the packets for that particular network flow, you can also retrieve arbitrary PCAP from your sensors. Just enter the parameters that you're looking for and the sensor where you expect them to be, and they'll be retrieved for viewing in this web interface, just like that single event was. Now, moving down the list, the next thing we want to look at will be downloads. As you can see from the red warning banner, these agents are not supported in an evaluation install like this because evaluation lacks some of the components that the agents rely on. With that said, a production installation of Security Onion will include this download section as well, and the agents will be fully functional. What these agents do is collect telemetry data from the Windows, Linux, and macOS endpoints in your environment. Things like network connection data, process creation events, file system writes, and more. Installing these agents will give you a tremendous amount of endpoint telemetry, all viewable in Hunt or dashboards, for investigating your environment. Best of all, because these agent ingestion pipelines generate and include some of the same metadata as the network information you're collecting in Security Onion, you can do things like pivot from a Suricata IDS alert to the endpoint logs and determine exactly which process on the endpoint opened the offending network collection and how that process executable was written to the endpoint file system. It's an incredibly powerful capability. These agents were all pre-built and pre-configured for your environment during the installation process. Deployment is just a matter of installing the package on your endpoint and telling the Security Onion firewall to accept the connection. If you'd like more information on this, see our documentation and some of the other videos on this YouTube channel. Finally, let's take a look at administration. These administration options are for configuring the Security Onion grid itself. As you might expect, users allows you to create, 
disable, or modify user accounts in this web console. Grid Members is an administration screen used to add or remove nodes from your security on your deployment. Configuration shows all of the options for configuring the platform and changing things like firewall rules or log retention timelines. Finally, the license key can be used to unlock certain advanced enterprise features. For more details on that, check our documentation. As I mentioned earlier, these links below the horizontal line are all for third-party tools that have been integrated into Security Onion. Kibana, for example. Kibana is the web interface that Elastic provides for accessing the data in Elasticsearch. Security Onion comes with a set of Kibana dashboards that will allow you to do some drilling down. For example, if you want to concentrate on HTTP data, you can click on the network link here under Event Category, and then HTTP under Datasets. Now you'll see a bunch of individual tables and visualizations, something like the HTTP dashboard we looked at earlier, with the individual events listed down here at the bottom. It's important to remember that whether you're using Kibana or SOC to look at the data, it's all in the same Elasticsearch database, so you should be able to retrieve the same information either way. Elastic Fleet is the configuration interface for the Elastic agents you've deployed in your environment. Now in this simple evaluation install, there are only two agents listed, both of which are running here on SOEval. But in a production installation, all of the Elastic agents you've deployed would be listed here, along with their status and the policy that's been applied to them. A big advantage of Security Onion 2.4 and Elastic Agent over the earlier versions with their endpoint agents is that the configurations are all centrally controlled. So you don't need to visit or modify an endpoint directly to tell it to collect a different log file or change things. It can all be controlled through this fleet interface. OS Query Manager allows us to send OS Query requests to deployed Elastic Agents in the environment. This is an open standard, originally developed by Facebook, that treats the live network endpoints like a database and defines a query standard for them. For example, if I want to do something simple, like collect the names of all the user accounts in the machines in my network, I could run a query across all the agents. The Security Onion server would then reach out and contact every agent and tell it to return all the information about users, independent of what operating system is running on the individual endpoints. It's a great source of live telemetry information during an investigation, when you need to know things like, does anyone else have this C2 implant in their downloads directory? InfluxDB we've already talked about. CyberChef is a web-based tool for encoding and decoding data, along with doing some other interesting tasks like generating encryption keys or extracting images from a packet capture. Let's show how it works with a simple exercise. Paste this into the input box. The interface is very simple. You simply drag over these operations to make a recipe, which is followed sequentially by the program. Now this looks like hex encoding, so let's start there. Convert it from hex. Now you see the output for that for hex operation in the output window here in the corner. It looks like base64, so let's add base64 decoding to the recipe. And as you can see, that decoded the base64 to return the original message. CyberChef is available from the menu, like we just launched it, but it can also be pivoted to directly from the SOC interface. So if you have a packet capture or a log field that contains encoded text or embedded objects like files or images, CyberChef can decode and extract artifacts without ever leaving your web browser. It's a very handy tool. Finally, the Navigator is a local copy of the Attack Navigator, color-coded by your coverage according to the Sigma rules that are enabled in your environment. We'll talk more about that in Workflow 3, but the basic idea is that each rule is tagged with the attack technique that it helps to detect. This chart will be updated as you enable rules, so you can see where there are gaps in your detection coverage. It's very handy as you tune your environment to try to eliminate blind spots and enhance your detective controls. So that about wraps it up. Those are all of the different tools that come in Security Onion. I know that was a lot of information to cover all at once, and I apologize if it was overwhelming, but I wanted to at least introduce everything so you've got some context to build on for later in the training. Once again, we'll discuss alerts and cases much more in Workflow 1, hunt and dashboards in Workflow 2, and detections in Workflow 3. 
Next up, a brief video on keeping your security onion installation up to date.